Good afternoon, brethren. Please take your Bibles and turn to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4, and uh, we just had that passage read to us. And uh, through this passage, you'll notice that, uh, I guess, from the, about the midpoint to the end, Paul is naming a lot of believers, right? You notice that some of those names were hard to pronounce, hard to read. But I just want you to think about this, because we're talking about the Word of God here. We're talking about something that is penned for all eternity. And imagine having your name in the Bible, okay? And how your name is going to be remembered is what the Bible says about you. You know, these people that, that are mentioned here, you know, ticket. Uh, uh, Tychicus and, and Onesimus and, and all these other names, you know, they're just regular people. They're just regular believers like anyone else at New Life Baptist Church. Just like, you know, it could be Brother Jason or Callum or, you know, Brother Tim or Brother Rob, you know, etc. Brother Caleb, you know, Nicholas, Matthias, etc. You know, it could be any person that makes up a local church. You know, these are regular people that have been named by Paul and they're being recognized for all eternity for the work and the service they did. Okay, And it's not just positive things. Sometimes it is even negative things that are mentioned for us in the Bible. But could you imagine if you lived in these days, if the Bible was being penned when you were alive and you were part of the work, you were part of the church, what would the Apostle Paul write about you? What would God move uh, men to say about your name? And the title for the sermon this afternoon is, How Will You Be Remembered? How Will You Be Remembered? Look at Colossians chapter 4 and verse number 7. So the purpose for this sermon, it might be a little bit different to the ones that you're normally used to me preaching. We're just going to go through the names in this chapter and names in other parts of the Bible and just to show you what the Bible says about them. And I want you as a believer, as a member of a local church, to ask yourself the question, how will I be remembered? How does God remember what I have done in service for Him? And I hope it challenges you. I hope it challenges you to see how these early Christians behaved, what they were known for, and I hope you desire to be a little bit more like these righteous that are mentioned. So look at the first name, <clears throat> Colossians chapter 4, verse 7. It says, All my states shall... Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I want to narrow into the last uh, words there. He, uh, Tychicus is known as a fellow servant in the Lord. Okay, So not only is he a servant, but he's a fellow servant. You know, this man, according to Paul, is someone that would come alongside, would be a fellow to another believer, and they would do the work of God forever. They would do the work of God, and, sorry, and, his, and his reputation is uh, noted for all eternity. It's noted forever, being a fellow servant in the Lord. And so again, as we go through these names, I want you to ask yourself the question, am I a fellow servant in the Lord? Am I serving the local body? Am I serving with other people and doing works that God has called us to do? And if you're listening to the broadcast and you can hear that sound, it's a bit of rain. So I might have to speak a little bit louder to make sure my, my voice uh, is louder than the rain on the, on the roof there. So oh, hopefully the rain stops. That would be great. Okay. Now look at verse number 9. You know, are you a Tychicus? Or are you more an uh, on, Onesimus? Okay, Onesimus. I'm going to struggle with some of these names. Onesimus, here in verse number 9, when it's mentioned, it says, uh, With Onesimus, <clears throat> a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. So Onesimus, how is he known? As a faithful and beloved brother. How would you like to be known as someone that is faithful? Someone that is a beloved brother? brother you know when they see you they see you as my brother or sister in the lord you know what kind of relationships have you formed in your local church you know i know we use this term brother so and so or sister so and so but do you actually mean it did you notice that they're not all called brother and sister so and so okay but specifically when it says here faithful and beloved brother it's because he sees this believer as someone as close as family Someone that will be as close 
as a brother, someone that's faithful to the believers, someone that is faithful to the work of God. Brethren, what would God say about you if you could write your name in the Bible? Okay, What would God say? And I want you to really focus on this because are you living up to the standard that we see believers live up to in the Word of God? Okay, let's go to verse number 10. Now it's Aristarchus. Aristarchus, in Colossians chapter 4, verse 10, it says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, salute a few. Okay, so what is he? A fellow prisoner. He's someone who has sacrificed himself. He's been able to step out, you know, against uh, people that were, you know, uh, trying to prevent them from preaching the word. Okay, he's, he's upsetting people by standing on the word of God, so much so that he's thrown into prison. And of course, the Apostle Paul, when he wrote uh, Colossians, was in prison himself. And so he sees a fellow brother in the Lord. He sees a fellow prisoner there who has also been arrested and cast into prison. You know, are you willing to go to prison for the Lord? Do you think that's who you are? And I don't know. You know, until that time comes, I mean, I hope. You know, obviously it's my desire to, no matter what, to stand on the Word of God and say, well, the Bible says this, and if you want to arrest me about that, if you want to arrest me for my belief, so be it, and be a fellow prisoner. But you know what? I think when it comes to true persecution, when it comes to being arrested, it could cause people to turn away. It could cause people to not want to go through that struggle. You know, are you willing, brethren, to lose your liberties, to be arrested and go to prison for the Lord, for what the Word of God says? What a standard to live by. And again, these are normal believers just like you and I that are being named such. Now, what great honor to be given these titles, knowing that, hey, I'm going to be forever recognized as that fellow prisoner. You know, I went to prison uh, for the Lord. And then it says, notice that the rest of verse number 10, it says, and Marcus, now we know Marcus, that's Mark, John Mark, okay? Um, it says here, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom ye received commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. And so Marcus, now, I don't know if you remember this story, but uh, you may remember how Paul and Barnabas went on missions trips together, right? They would go out and, and preach the gospel to Gentile, uh, Gentiles into other places besides Israel and Jerusalem. And on one of these journeys, Mark comes along, okay? But then he backs out, and Paul is very upset with Mark. So much so that there's a strong argument between Paul and Barnabas. You know, Paul wanted to just forget about Barnabas, move on, Barnabas wanted to give Mark another chance. I don't know if you remember that story. Now, this verse actually helps us understand. Well, we, first of all, we know that Barnabas is, is a person who's very encouraging to the brethren, first and foremost. But secondly, we understand a little bit more why he cared maybe more for Marcus than maybe what Paul did is because Mark or Marcus was the sister's son to Barnabas. So he's Barnabas' nephew. Okay, so Barnabas' sister is the mother of of Mark. So now you can understand where that relationship exists and why Barnabas wanted to give Mark, you know, a second chance when Paul was ready to move on. And so, but here's the thing about Mark. Okay, I know Mark is mentioned here. And, uh, but in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, these are the words of Paul once again, even though he wanted to give up on Mark, he says later on in his life, take Mark and bring him with thee for he is profitable to me for the ministry. He is profitable to me for the ministry. Okay? So Mark was profitable. And that's going to be forever written in the Word of God about Mark. What a great thing to be known for. Are you profitable, brethren? Are you profitable to the ministry? You know, or are you a deficit? You know? Does this ministry, does New Life Baptist Church, is it more blessed by having you here or is it not blessed? You know, I want you to think about that. You know, do you add profit to this church or do you not? Do you help encourage and build up people and welcome visitors in this church and ass assist with the service and the work wherever it is that you can help with? Is that you? Are you profitable? Or are you someone that sucks up 
the resources? Are you someone that is always in conflict and, and always discouraged and always upset and you bring other people down? Or are you profitable? What would you like to be known for for all eternity in the Word of God? I'm sure it would be someone that would be profitable to the ministry. And Mark was eventually known as that person. And here's the thing. If what I just said offends you, you know, and you're saying, well, of course I'm profitable. Look, at one time, Mark was a deficit. At one time, Mark caused division between Paul and Barnabas. At one time, Paul was discouraged by Mark's refusal to go on the mission field. Okay? But what's happened? He's worked his way out. right? He's worked his way. He's matured. He's grown. He's become more spiritual. And he's become, at this point, profitable for Paul. So look, you know, if you're someone that doesn't meet up to these standards of the people that we read, well, the point behind this is that you work toward this standard, that you work toward being someone that is recognized for all eternity for the work and service that you did unto the Lord. Now let's go to verse number 11, same chapter. Justice. It says here, and Jesus, now that Jesus is not the Jesus, that, you know, Son of God Jesus that we commonly know. Uh, this Jesus, which is called Justice, that's another name that's given to him, who are of the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. So we see that he's a fellow worker in the kingdom, but notice, we already sort of spoke about that, but notice the next words, which have been a comfort unto me. So justice for all eternity is known as someone that gives comfort. Okay? Are you someone that gives comfort to the brethren? Are you someone that's encouraging to the brethren? You know, when someone's upset or discouraged or, or, or cast down, are you someone that comes along and brings comfort to that person? Or are you more likely the person that will kick them while they're down? Okay? What do you want to be known for for all eternity? You know, how will you be remembered? What will God say if he could just write that one sentence about your life? What would he say? And for justice, he said, well, here's a comfort. He's someone that encourages and comforts the brethren. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11, it says, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. So another way of saying comforting together is to edify. That's building each other up. Are you someone that builds up your brother? Or are you someone that wants to tear them down? What, you know, what do you, how would you describe yourself as a person that makes up New Life Baptist Church? Now look at verse number 12. Verse number 12. Epaphras. Epaphras. See in Colossians chapter 4 verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, salute of you, notice the next words, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. This goes pretty well with my sermon that I preached this morning about you know, the need to have a prayer life. Well, what is Epaphras known for? For his fervent prayers, for laboring fervently in prayers. You know, do you value prayer? Because look, it's work. It's labor. Okay? And someone that prays for someone else, hey, they're laboring for that person. They're trying to be a help unto that person. They're petitioning the Lord God that Lord God will step in and bless someone. You know, what is your prayer life like? When you go to the Lord and pray, do you just ask about the things you need, the things you want? Or in your mind, are you more like Epaphras and you're asking the Lord for others, for the Lord to answer their prayers? Do you think about others? Do you pray for others? Or are you more likely to just pray for yourself and your own needs? And look, there's nothing wrong for praying for yourself. There's nothing wrong with that. That's actually a lot easier than praying for other people. And you know what? As a pastor, if you have a desire to be a pastor one day, you have to be someone willing to pray for others. Okay, to petition the Lord for your church, for the spiritual growth of the people in your church. You have to have this love and this labor in prayer. You know, never think that prayer is irrelevant or not important or just some breeze. I don't know about you, but I struggle to pray sometimes because it's labor. It's a spiritual work. Okay? And if you struggle in prayer, then make sure you come to our Wednesday night services when we have our prayer time together. 
so that you can be laboring together as one body in the Lord in prayer. You know, will you be remembered, brethren, as someone that labored fervently in prayers? Now look at verse number 14. We have Luke. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. I want to focus in on Luke before Demas. Luke, the beloved physician. What is he known as? The beloved physician. What's a physician? That's like a, a, a local GP, a doctor, I suppose we would call it today. Okay, so he's known for his work. He's known for his career, you know. But more so than that, what is he? The beloved physician. Beloved. You know, Luke was someone that is easy to love. Luke is someone that's easy to get along with. Luke was someone that people liked. He was someone that was friendly. He was beloved. People loved being around him. You know, I, what are you like, Reverend? Do people call you beloved? I'm not necessarily saying the literal sense, but do people enjoy your company? Do you, you know, step out and make people feel, you know, uh, 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 worthy, you know, of your attention, of your care, of your prayers? You know, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 18, verse 24, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. If you say, look, I've got no friends. I've got no friends in life. I've got no friends in church. Well, the Bible's got to be true. Okay? And the Bible's saying that if you want to have friends, you must show yourself friendly. Okay? You can't just go around and tear people down, tear people down people's opinions, you know, think that you're better than other people, okay? Even if you're giving someone attention, if all you're doing is tearing down their life, tearing down their opinions, they're not going to think you're friendly. They're not going to consider you beloved. But when it comes to Luke, you know, and God, of course, used Luke to write the book of Luke and the book of Acts, he was beloved. People liked him, okay? And of course, you know, he wasn't someone just seeking to please men. He sought to please God first and foremost. But once that was settled, where he could make sure he's pleasing God, he stepped out of, you know, out of his way to make people comfortable, to make people feel like they've got a friend in Luke. Brethren, what are you known for? Would you be considered beloved? Do people know you as someone that loves your brethren? Are you someone, when the visitor attends our church, that says, hey, that man, that woman, she made me feel loved. She or he was friendly toward me. And look, you can't hide, you know, behind being an introvert. You know, people say, well, you know, I'm, I'm not friendly. Uh, you know, I don't greet visitors because I'm an introvert. No, that's just you being lazy. Okay, I know people are introverts and people are extroverts, okay? But listen, the new man, the spiritual man, the born-again spirit is not an introvert. He's not an extrovert. He's like Jesus Christ. He's like the Holy Spirit. And you know, Jesus Christ was welcoming to hundreds, yea, thousands of people that would come to his ministry and just hear him speak. Not only that, he even fed them. You know, 4,000 men, 5,000 men at a later time. He even fed people that would come Jesus was welcoming to the visitors. Okay? This is not about being an introvert or extrovert. If you don't want to make people comfortable, you don't want to be that friend, that's got nothing to do about your personality. That has everything to do about your lack of spiritual walk. That's got to do with your carnal flesh. And look, the introvert that doesn't go out of his way to greet you know, somebody, yeah, he may have to do more work than the average person to welcome somebody. You know, to be that beloved person, you might have to do more work. That's fine. But if you ignore visitors, that's just your selfishness. Okay? And the extrovert, yeah, he might find it easier to welcome the visitors, the extrovert. But listen, the extrovert can get in the flesh as well. And the extrovert will most likely, if he's in the flesh, boast of himself, lift himself up, instead of actually caring for the person that's visiting. Or not even a visitor, just a brother or sister that's in the church. Look, I know that we can't all be friends. We can't all have a close relationship. Listen, the only close friend that I have, number one, should be God, and then my wife. I mean, I don't really go around and sharing private information about myself to anybody else. I pretty much have the Lord God, He's my friend, my wife, she's the closest person. You know, I can share anything I have in my heart toward her if I need to. 
you know, or listen to what she has to say. And then when it comes to everybody else, pretty much for me, everyone else is on an equal plane. You know, all the brothers and sisters that I have in the Lord, I want to treat them the same. I want to treat them equally. You know, I want to get along with people. Even when I look at people's life and I say, well, I wouldn't do that. I think that person's making a mistake. You know, I don't think that person's doing that right. At the end of the day, if you're my brother and sister in the Lord, I want to see you as a beloved and I want you to consider me as a beloved. I'm harping on about this one point a little too much. Let's keep going. Verse number uh, 15. Verse number 15. We will come back to Demas. So Demas was mentioned in verse number 14. Uh, we will come back to him. But Colossians chapter 4, verse 15 reads, Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea, and Nymphus, now this is the man, Nymphus, and the church which is in his house. Hey, what's Nymphus known for? For having a church, allowing a church body to gather in his own home, in his own house. Okay, now what that tells me is that Nymphus was there for every service, right? Every church service, Nymphus was there. Why? Because it's in, it's in his house, okay? He's got no choice. You know what that means? That he's got to be so hospitable to allow groups of people to come into his house. Hey, it requires to probably clean up before they arrive. It requires to be, you know, cleaned up after they leave. But Nymphus was willing to offer his own house to hold the church service there and so i believe you know nymphus represents someone that is faithful to church faithful to church but notice what church was gathered in his house which church was it it's there in verse number 15 salute the brethren which are in laodicea now i don't know if you guys remember remember when i did the series on the seven churches in the book of revelation well what was the worst church on that list or at least yeah definitely one of the worst churches there the church in Laodicea. Remember that? Church in Laodicea. I'll just read to you in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Now, before I read Revelation 3, 20, this is about 30 years, at least, I reckon, about 30 years after what was written in Colossians chapter 4. Okay? It's about 30 years later. So we know he's got a, the Laodicean church in his house. That's where they're meeting right now. I guess it's not that big at this point in time if they can meet in a house. But then in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, like I said, about 30 years later, Jesus says about the church, Behold... I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. So what does Jesus say about the Laodicean church some 30 years later? Jesus wasn't even there. All right, Jesus was outside, as it were, knocking on the door. Hey guys, let me in. Hey guys, oh great, you're having church service, but can you at least worship God? Can you at least mention my name? Can you at least pray my name? Can you at least preach the things that I taught in the Word of God? Hey, they had forgotten all about Jesus. They made it about some activity, some social gathering. They totally forgot to the Lord. They totally forgot the Lord some 30 years later after the book of Colossians. What does that tell me? Okay, what does that tell me? The fact that Paul here is greeting the church. Obviously, they were a good church at this point in time. 30 years later, what do we have? A generational shift. Right, a generational shift. So we have now, you know, the children in Colossians have now become the adults. Maybe the church has grown. Maybe they have allowed some false prophets to creep in. You know, some tears amongst the wheat. And now, some, maybe some false doctrines for sure. And their hearts were not even set on Jesus Christ. Okay. So what's the lesson for us as a New Life Baptist Church? Hey, my desire is that 30 years from now, you know, whether it's me or someone else, that this church will be going strong for the Lord, you know, that we will continue serving Him, that we continue to worship the Lord in, in prayer, in, in Bible study, in preaching, in door-to-door -door soul winning, or some other ways to get the gospel out. That's my desire 30 years from now. But we need to make sure that our children, that our children grow up and understand the doctrines that we've had time to learn. You know, a lot of us as adults, if you've been saved later in life or maybe you were in some corrupt church and now you're getting good teaching, um, it's taken us time to learn good doctrine, hasn't it? It's taken us time to study, to, to challenge, to, to talk about, you know, to different people. And if we've come to a better understanding of the scriptures, you know, we feel more like we have a greater knowledge of the scriptures. The Holy Spirit has been working in our lives. 
but we can't forget that our children also need to do their own study. They need to do their own Bible reading. They need their own personal relationship with God. They need to desire to be in church. You know, right now, my kids are here in church because I make them come to church. My desire, you know, in 10 years' time, in 20 years' time, is that you guys will continue being in church, whether it's Dad's church or whether it's some other good church that's preaching the, the right gospel, that's serving the Lord, and say, hey, yes, Mom and Dad took me to church, but now I want to be in church because I love Jesus Christ. I love my salvation. I want to see people saved. And we don't want to become like the church in Laodicea that really dropped the ball and forgot all about Jesus Christ. But notice, we're talking about how will you be remembered. We're not talking about so much the church here, but Nymphus, forever remembered as someone who is willing to open his doors for the church, that they can be gathered in his house. Okay, look at verse number 17. Colossians chapter 4, verse 17. Archippus, Archippus. Colossians chapter 4, verse 17. And, and say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Okay. So Archippus, you can see here, has been given a ministry from the Lord. Now, everyone's been given a ministry. If you're saved, you have the ministry of reconciliation. We all have the job to preach the gospel and see souls saved. Okay? But the fact that this has been specifically mentioned means I truly believe that Archippus was a pastor. Okay? Or some other leader in his local church. Now, if you can keep your finger there and go to James chapter 3. Go to James chapter 3. And while you turn to James chapter 3, I'm going to read to you from uh, Philemon verse 2. Philemon verse 2, because Archippus is mentioned in Philemon verse 2. Uh, Paul's writing saying, and to our, he writes to our, uh, sorry, and to our beloved uh, Apphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. So Archippus also had a church that was meeting in his house. But notice he's also called a fellow soldier. That's in Philemon verse 2. A fellow soldier. Hey, so this is a man that would go to the war, go to war. This is a man who had the armor of God, who had the sword of the Spirit, okay, ready to take on the enemies, ready to preach the gospel, ready to stand strong, ready to get into a spiritual battle, Archippus was, to the fact that he now had a church in his house. And this is why I believe he was an ordained pastor or something along those lines, because in Colossians, it's mentioned that he has received a ministry from the Lord, okay? So this is a great thing to be known for, for all eternity, that the Lord God gave you a ministry, that the Lord gave you leadership over a local church. But when you look at Colossians 4 verse 17, you'll notice that Paul is giving Archippus a bit of a soft rebuke. Okay, Because it seems like Archippus here had maybe gotten a little bit discouraged in the ministry. Because it says, and say to Archippus, take heed. It means pay attention. Listen up, Archippus to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, and then it says this, that thou fulfill it. Hey, finish it. Finish what you started. Finish the work that God has given you to do, Archippus. And so I feel like maybe Archippus here needed that gentle rebuke, that gentle reminder. Maybe he's getting a little discouraged. Who knows why? Okay. And he's saying, look, God's given you a ministry. Finish the work. Okay. And so, you know, these other names are not being rebuked in any sort of way. They're just being praised. But when it comes to a spiritual leader, when it comes to a pastor, I believe here, he's being rebuked by Paul. And the reason for this, you guys are in James chapter 3, verse 1. It says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. You see, pastors or people that are in leadership in a church, if they are in sin, in wickedness, they're going to be judged much harsher than the average church member okay and if so, you know if a pastor finds himself in great sin let's say fornication uh, well, not fornic adultery because he's got to be married right so it'll be adultery or you know taking you know addicted to drugs or you know gambling or you know we've seen some of these things before from previous pastors hey these pastors need to be called out these pastors need to be condemned and they need to step down because they're no longer blameless they no longer meet up to the qualifications 
of the Bible. And so as Paul's going through Colossians chapter 4, you notice it gives that bit of a rebuke there. You know, Archippus, you know, get encouraged, get back, you know, finish the work that God has given you to do. And I, I'm thankful for that because, you know, during, and I've said this, maybe I sound like a broken record. You know, I, as a pastor during this corona lockdown, I kind of got a little discouraged, right? A little uh, unmotivated. Uh, not because, you know, it's because you try to preach to a camera <laughs> with no one else around, you know? And it, it's hard to feed off, you know, the energy in the room and, and, you know, singing. You know, I'd sing my hymns before I preached and there'd be no other voices. It's just me, me and the Lord, right? And uh, so obviously it's, it's very different. The Bible says that when two or three are gathered in his name, there he is in the midst. And so obviously by having a church service, even with you know, two or three people, as long as it's a local body of the Lord, you know, having that congregation together is a powerful thing. It's something where the Lord will bless and do great work in. And so Archippus had somehow become a little discouraged here and is being called out by Paul. But look, thank God, you know, I mean, it seems like he's doing a decent job. He just needed to get back on track. All right, now, if you, if you can, I'll to get to turn to some other references. But, you know, I hope you think about, you know, how will you be remembered? What will God say if he could write your name in a sentence right next to it? What would he say about you? Okay, now, when it comes to Enoch, now, I'll get you, you're in James, so, or maybe you've turned back, but go to James chapter 2. Go to James chapter 2, and I'm going to talk about Abraham there, but... For now, I'm going to go to Enoch, one of the Old Testament saints. And in Genesis chapter 5, verse 22, regarding Enoch, it says, And Enoch walked with God. You know, that's in verse number 22. And then in verse number 24, it says, And Enoch walked with God. Okay? So both Genesis 5.22 and Genesis 5.24 says that Enoch walked with God. And then, so... My, you know, my question to you, brethren, is are you someone that's walking with the Lord? You know, brethren, are you someone that is in fellowship with the Lord, someone that is serving the Lord? Are you walking with the Lord the way that Enoch is recorded in the Bible to have walked with the Lord? Come in, brother. Come join us, brother. So we have someone else in our church. Don't worry, we're still within the, the limit of 10 for the online recording. We're safe, brother Michael. We're recording. We've got church service. You can join us. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, you guys are in James chapter 2. James chapter 2, verse 23, please. James chapter 2 and verse 23, referring to Abraham. And I love what he said about Abraham. I mean, God could have said so many things about Abraham, but he says something very specific here in uh, James chapter 2, verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith... Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. How would you like to be known for all eternity that you were the friend of God? Man, a friend is a wonderful thing if you could find a good one. All right? I mean, just having, imagine having God as your friend. You know, normally when you think of friends, you think about you know, spending time with them, having a laugh together, enjoying each other's company. Is that how God thinks of you? Does God think of you as his friend, the way he you know, spoke of Abraham? And once again, for all eternity, what do we all know? For all eternity in heaven, you know, 10,000 years from now in heaven, we'll remember when we see Abraham, oh, there's God's friend. And there's God's friend that was serving the Lord, that was speaking to the Lord, that had a great time with the Lord. Are you going to be known, brethren, as a friend of God? What about Job? Job, and I'll just read it to you. I'll get you guys to turn to Acts 13. Go to Acts 13. I'll get into that later on. But while you're turning there, I'll just talk to you about Job. And in Job chapter 1, verse 1, Job chapter 1 and verse 1, the Bible reads, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright. Notice he's perfect and upright. And one that feared God and eschewed evil. Hey, he hated evil. He didn't want to do anything wrong. He didn't want to do anything wicked. His desire was that he just wanted to please the Lord. He had a great fear of God. Hey, do you notice how those two things go together? In order for you to give up your sins, to overcome the wickedness in your life, you've got to have a fear of God. You've got to fear what God may do unto you, how God may chastise you when, you're, when you do wrong. I mean, like mom and dad, right? When mom and dad, you know, you guys do something wrong, there should be a healthy fear. A fear that you know, mom and dad love me, they're going to correct me, they're going to chastise me, 
I don't want to face the chastisement, but I know they're doing it because they love me. Hey, and that was Job. You know, he didn't want to disappoint God. He wanted to keep himself from evil. And the Bible says he was someone that was perfect and upright. Okay, so perfect in the Bible means complete. Okay, he was a well-rounded believer. It's not saying perfect like without sin. We all have sin. Okay, Job, of course, had sin. But he's someone who had the Lord God as his God. He was someone that had forgiveness of sin, someone that was saved and lived his life to overcome the wickedness and evil that he would face. Moses. What does the Bible say about Moses? What is recorded for all eternity? Now, what, what he said about Moses is amazing to me. It says in Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, Now the man Moses was very meek. Now look, if I said to you, you know what, guys, I'm such a meek person, would that be meek of me to say that? No, a meek person would not say, I'm very meek. A meek person wouldn't even say he's meek. Because as soon as you start saying that, what are you you're being filled with? Pride. All right, you're very proud. But what if God says, no, this man is very meek? Would that be, then be true? Absolutely. It's coming from the, the Lord God. And look, Jesus Christ is known as someone that was meek. Our Lord God is meek. Okay? But he says about Moses, Moses was very meek. Notice the next words, above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Out of everybody that lived on the earth in the days of Moses, the most meek man was Moses himself. Notice how God chooses the meek, how he can work in those that are meek. Moses did not feel at this point in his life that he was the person that would deliver the Israelites from the Egyptians. Early in his life, he thought he would be the one to deliver the, the um, Israelites, but it wasn't the right time. He got discouraged. He fled Egypt. God calls him 40 years later and says, all right, Moses, it's time. And by then, Moses is like, oh, it's too late, Lord. I'm old. I can't talk. I can't do what you want me to do. And God says, you know, you're, you are a very meek person. I'm going to be using you. You are the meek. Now, if you want to be used by God, you know, it's not about you being proud. It's not about you being puffed up. Okay, with, with whatever you think you may be puffed up by your, by your appearance, by your skills, by your knowledge, by the way you speak. Hey, God does not want that person. God wants to use the meek. And listen, so much so that Moses was able to deliver an entire nation out of slavery through the power of God. What is Moses known for for all eternity as being very meek, more meek than anybody else on this earth? Once again, what does God say about you? Do you live up to this standard of these men? Once again, who are these men? Normal men, normal believers, normal people that struggle with a sinful flesh, normal people that have weaknesses, and yet God was able to use them mightily and record these great words about these men. You're in Acts chapter 13. Let's go to Acts 13, verse 22. Acts 13, verse 22. This is a much more common um, understanding or a statement that's made about a man of God. In Acts 13, verse 22, speaking about King David, it says, And when he removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. So what is King David known as? A man after God's own heart. Hey, he wanted to love the things that God loved. He wanted to hate the things that God hated. He wanted the heart of God. That's what he sought after. He says, Lord, I want to be more like you. Lord, teach me what's good. I want to do what's good. Teach me what's wrong. I don't want to do what's wrong. Teach me what you hate. I want to have your heart. I want to have your love. That was King David. He wanted to be more like his Savior. And hey, we ought to have a desire to be more like Christ. Okay? We have to follow after his steps. We have the teachings of the Word of God. We see how Jesus Christ lived his life. And we ought to strive to live after his ways. We ought to strive to be people after God's own heart. Will God say that about you in eternity? That brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, she was someone after my own heart. Will God say that about you? Now, I'll get you to turn to Mark chapter 3. Turn to Mark chapter 3. And while you're turning to Mark chapter 3, I'm going to read to you from Numbers 14. And we're going to look at Caleb. Now, Caleb is one of the two spies, Caleb and Joshua, you may remember, that went into the promised land with the other spies. And these two said, hey, the Lord will, del will deliver the enemies into our hands. 
we can get into that nation, we can go into that land, we can take it for ourselves as the Lord God promised. But then when he came to the other spies, they all said, no, we're like, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. You know, they're like giants. There's no way we can defeat these guys, okay? And you may know the story, the Lord got upset with Israel and they were to wander in the wilderness for another 40 years and that generation were not permitted to enter into the promised land except for those two spies, uh, Joshua and Caleb. And the Bible says in Numbers 14, verse 23, Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. So that's that generation that would not go into the promised land. But then it says this, But my servant Caleb. Hey, is that what God says about you? My servant, your name? Will God write that in his books of eternity, that you were a servant of God? It says, but my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and it's not another spirit, how we kind of term it, right? The other spirit is different to the spirit that was in those that were uh, too afraid to go into the promised land. Hey, he had the spirit of God. He had the Holy Spirit empowering him and to give him wisdom. He had the spirit of God. And then it says this, and have followed me fully. Him will I bring into the land whereinto he went, and his seed shall possess it. Hey, not only was he the servant of God, not only did he have the Spirit of God, but it says here that God wrote about him, he had followed me fully. Okay? It, so he was someone that just, his whole desire was to follow after what God wanted, to walk in the steps that God sought for his life. Fully. He wasn't half-hearted. He wasn't, well, Lord, I'll do the minimum. No, he wanted to go above and beyond and be fully following God. You know what Jesus says in John chapter 12, verse 26? He says, if any man serve me, hey, what was Caleb called? My servant. Okay, so if any man serve me, let him follow me. What was said about Caleb? He had followed me fully. Hey, if you want to be a servant, if you want God to write for all eternity, that brother so-and-so was a servant, you have to follow him. Follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. We're talking about how will you be remembered for all eternity. The Bible says that if you become a servant, if you follow after the footsteps of Christ, that God the Father will honor you. Hey, just like Caleb was honored, just in this passage alone, to be known as a servant, someone that followed fully, someone that had the Spirit of God working in his life. Now, where did I get you to turn? Mark 3? Mark 3? Go to Mark 3, verse 17. Mark 3, verse 17. And this is, of course, the disciples of Jesus, apostles. And uh, Jesus starts to, you know, of, you know ch he chose his disciples. And then with some of his disciples, he gives them names. Like with uh, Simon, he gave him the name uh, Peter, right? And so we're talking about James and John here. And James and John were two brothers. But in Mark 3, 17, he's choosing them. He says, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, and his surname, this is what Jesus gave them the name, and he surnamed them uh, Boanerges, which is the sons of thunder. The sons of thunder. That's what Jesus Christ called these two brothers. You say, what does that mean? You know what? I'm not too sure. But it sounds pretty cool. <laughs> Could you imagine that Jesus would call you, and, and you'll see you know, your brothers and sisters here right now, you know, the sons, the sisters of thunder. All right, now here's what I think it means. Here's what I think it means. You know, these are talking about sons here, right? What I believe this is referring to, okay? Because when Jesus Christ brought in his disciples, what did he uh, say that he was going to turn them into? Into fishes of men. Remember that? So the whole purpose of getting the disciples was that he could uh, teach them, he could uh, help them along, and that they would eventually become soul winners, right? They would eventually become preachers. And so these two brothers are known as the sons of thunder. Now look, this is a bit of my guess, of course. You know, the Bible doesn't really tell us exactly what that means. But I don't think it needs to be that complicated. Because when we think about thunder, what do we think about? Don't we think about a lot, like a big noise? You know, something that might even spook people, right? When it, it usually comes along with lightning, lightning and thunder, right? So it's a, it's a big display is what I'm trying to say. It's a big noise, a big display. And I think what uh, James and John, sorry, uh, yeah, John and James 
I think what they were, I think they were powerful preachers. I think these guys had big voices, all right? So when they preached, it thundered, all right? When they preached, it drew a crowd, it drew attention. And I, think, I think that's why they're called Sons of Thunder, because they were uh, powerful in their delivery. They had big voices, you know, they preached loudly. Maybe they were the kind of people that could get on a hill and preach to 100 people, 200 people without an amplifier. You know, maybe those those big voices that Jesus used to get the gospel out when there were, you know, great multitudes. That's what I believe the Sons of Thunder refers to. And if that's the case, that would then tell us that, well, the other ten disciples, when they preached, they probably weren't as powerful. They probably weren't as loud, okay? But that doesn't mean, just because you haven't got a big, booming voice, it doesn't mean that you can't be used by God to serve Him, to work for Him, to deliver, you know, a message or deliver uh, the gospel, But I think, you know, imagine not being known for all eternity. This is the name that Jesus Christ gave these brothers, the Sons of Thunder. Pretty cool name. All right, please go to Luke chapter 6. Go to Luke chapter 6, and I'll read to you from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. I'm going to read to you from 2 Timothy 1, 16. You go to Luke 6, and I'm going to now go to Onesiphorus. Onesiphorus. Some challenging names here. But in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16, the Bible reads, The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. So what is he known for all eternity? As someone that refreshed Paul. You know, we need people in our church to be the refresher. Now, Paul was a hardworking man. God was using him mightily. He didn't even have a family, right? He was... Uh, Um, a eunuch for the kingdom of God. He didn't have his own wife, didn't have his own kids, so God could use him in a powerful way to, you know, dedicate his entire life, you know, getting the gospel, traveling, you know, suffering, you know, being thrown in jail, all these things. And quite often, every now and again, Paul would need somebody to just go and encourage him. You know, your ministry might just be to encourage another brother. That's it. Someone that's, you know, that's serving the Lord with their full ability and you know what? It gets tiring because it is work. It is spiritual work. There is the devil. There is the forces of darkness that are working against the local church, working against the soul winner. And sometimes brethren just need to be encouraged, to be told, hey, good job. Keep working. I'm praying for you. What can I do? Do you need some finances? Can I help you to preach the gospel? Do you need some resources? What do you need, brother? Maybe that's all we need to be, the person that refreshes somebody else. And in verse number 17, it says this, But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me, says Paul. So Onesiphorus finds out that he's in the same city as Paul, and now he, he, he strives to go and find Paul. Okay? And then it says in verse number 18, The Lord grants unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day, and in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. So Onesiphorus, when he was in in Rome, he goes, I'm going to find Paul and I'm going to go and minister unto him. I'm going to see how I can be a help, how I can refresh my brother. Now, what I like about him is he steps outside of his local area. He goes and diligently seeks other brethren that he can be a blessing to. Are you going to be known as that person? You know, what kind of attitude do you have toward other brothers and sisters that are not in this city? not in this church. Maybe they are in other places in Australia. Maybe they are in other places in this world and they need to be refreshed. Maybe they don't have a good church to go to. Haven't we met some people on our you know, Friday night prayer meeting, people that don't have a good church that are in Australia, that have no good church to go to, and the best they can get out of it is listening to us pray together, <laughs> you know, listening to our preaching. Hey, we ought to be somebody that refreshes you know, and some of the feedback that I received from these people was that it was a great benefit to them to be part of the prayer night on, on a Friday, even though they're never going to, you know, probably never going to visit our church. I hope they can move and join our church, but we don't know if that's possible. But do you notice that Onesiphorus had a heart for other saints, people that were outside. He diligently went and sought after other brethren that he could bless, outside of the local congregation of people that he met. We need people like this. You know, we need to have a heart for believers that are outside of our network, our church network. You know, 
when we have, again, I've mentioned the visitors, but we ought to enjoy having visitors, encourage the visitors, and say, well, you know, you may not be like us. You might, might not just, you might not be new IFB. Who cares if they're a brother in the Lord? We ought to love them. We ought to encourage them. We ought to refresh them. We ought to diligently seek these people and try to be a help unto them. We can't be people that have the attitude, you know, us for and no more. You know, we're on the same page. We believe the same doctrines. You know, we don't want someone else to come and interrupt that flow. No, that, that's, a, that's a wicked attitude to have. We ought to be people that seek to refresh. What would God say about you? Are you someone that steps out of your comfort zone, seeking other brethren to bring them into the body, or just to be a, a blessing, just to refresh other brethren? Will God say that about you? You're in Luke 6, Luke 6 verse 15. Luke 6, verse 15. And uh, we're looking at Simon now. What a name that's given to Simon, one of the apostles of God, of Jesus. Luke 6, 15. Matthew and Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zelotes. You know what that means, Zelotes? That he's a zealot. He's zealous. He had, he had, he's zealous for the Lord. And one of the names that's been given to Simon, you know, because he's zealous, he's saying, hey, you're, you know, you're Zelotes. That's who you are. You're zealous for the things of God. I believe this is something that was positive in reference to Simon. Someone that was zealous. What does it mean to be zealous? To be excited. To be passionate. Hey, he was passionate for the things of God. You know, when he gets to church, he was excited. Yes, I'm here to sing praises. I'm here to worship God. I'm here to fellowship with my brothers. Hey, the, the lockdown's over. Praise God. Woo! That was Simon. Okay, he was full of zeal. He was excited. He, you'd think having someone like that would get other people excited for the things of the Lord. Okay? The Bible tells us in Titus 2.14, Titus 2.14, it says here, who gave, referring to Jesus, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. Notice the next words, zealous of good works. Does God want us to do good works? Now that we're saved, does God want us to do good works? Absolutely, right? But does he want us to do good works half-hearted? You know, oh, this is boring. Next hymn, uh, what hymn are we singing now? You know, I have a song that Jesus gave me. It was sent from heaven above. Is that how God wants us to be? With our works toward him? Or does he want us to be zealous? It says here that he's created us to be zealous of good works. He wants us to be excited, to be encouraged, right? So we sing it. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. You know, when we sing, when we do the works of God, we ought to do it as zealous people, excited to serve the Lord. Because listen, do you love the Lord God? Of course you should love Him. That He gave His only begotten Son that you could be saved. He took on your sin, that you can become a child of God. He's deserving of praise. And you know what I want for our church? That when we sing, when we get together, when we enjoy each other's company, that the Lord looks down and that He's pleased. I don't want any church service, the two services that we have on Sunday, the, the midweek service, I don't want it to be a service where it's empty, where the Lord doesn't get honoured, where the Lord doesn't get praised. I want every service for the Lord to be touched in his heart, for the Lord to be pleased, for the Lord to be blessed. And listen, you know how he's gonna, that's going to happen? By us being zealous, by being excited for the things of God. Man, I've been in church, kids. I grew up in church in your, at your age. And I'm telling you, it was a bore fest. I don't know, maybe that was my fault. Maybe that was my problem. I don't know. I'm telling you, everyone's quiet. No one's singing up. You know, everyone looks like they're just itching to get out of church. The preaching was boring. I mean, I don't know if my preaching is that great, but man, you know, I was like, what are we, you, you just go to church because you know you should be in church. You're not really doing it to the Lord. You do it out of, out of habit. You know, you do it to check off a box. I guess God's happy I went to church. I don't want you to be like that. I don't want anyone to be, I don't want to be like that. You know, we spend an hour, two hours more in church. Hey, let's enjoy it. This is our life. We're getting older, right? There's going to come a time when we pass away. And I want you to remember and look back and say, hey, I enjoyed being at New Life Baptist Church. I enjoyed singing praises. I got zealous. And that the Lord records that for all eternity. 
hey, that was a zealous church for me. That's what I want for New Life Baptist Church. Will God say that about you? And uh, now if you go to the book of John, go to the book of John. Actually, I'll get you to turn to 2 Timothy. Go to 2 Timothy. Go to 2 Timothy. And, uh, you know, there are two names, and I mentioned Demas, but I'll mention one, one other name. Well, actually, I'll mention three names. Judas Iscariot. Now, Judas was not saved. He was a reprobate. He was a non-believer. But he passed like a believer. He served Jesus. He did the work. He fellowshiped. He had friends in the ministry. He looked like any other disciple, any other apostle. So much so that even when Jesus says, Judas is the betrayer, Nobody believed it. It's like, it can't be Judas. He's just like us. And look, I don't know. I, I, it could be that we have a Judas in our church. It could be that we have a reprobate in our church. I don't know. I hope not. I, I, I'm, I don't think we do. Okay? But then, neither the apostles. Right? We, we, we never know. Okay? But I want to make sure that you are in church and you, when you hear the gospel, if you don't know the gospel already, that you call upon Christ to save you, or that as a believer, you go on and you grow and you continue to serve the Lord all the days of your life. But listen, if you're in this church and you're not even saved and you know it, you know you're not even saved, and you've heard the gospel and you're like, well, one day I'll believe it, one day I'll get saved, don't put it off because one day, just like Judas Iscariot, who was a non-believer, became a reprobate. Okay? And it says in John chapter 18, verse 2, and Judas also, which betrayed him. Hey, what's Judas Iscariot known for all eternity? As the one that betrayed Jesus Christ. In John 18, verse 5, they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with him. Hey, there's two passages right there. What's Judas known as? The betrayer. The one that betrayed Jesus Christ. Boy, it would break my heart if we have someone in this church that becomes a betrayer of Jesus Christ that becomes a reprobate. Listen, if you're not saved, you need to get that settled straight away. Straight away, before you become reprobate, before you cross that line with God. Okay, now, I don't know. I, I, I expect everybody in this church to be saved unless you're a little child and you know, your understanding is not there yet. But once again, these apostles, they would never have thought that it was Judas Iscariot. So the lesson there is we could never know we could have a reprobate in our midst and just never know, okay? The other person that I wanted to talk about is Esau. Esau. Now, Esau, I believe, was a saved man. I believe he was raised right. Maybe uh, a bit of, we see in the book of Genesis, some favoritism between the parents, between the kids. And I think this affected Esau and he made some terrible mistakes as he grew up. But Esau is known here in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 16. It says, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. What is Esau known for? And I, again, I believe he's saved. But what is he known for all eternity? As a fornicator. Okay? And a profane person. Profane. What does it mean to be profane? It's a person of disrespect. You know, he disrespected the truth of the word of God. He didn't live in accordance to the way that God wanted him to live. He lived a very wicked life as a believer and he fornicated. You know, he had multiple marriages, married unsaved women, you know, things like that. And the Bible for all eternity knows him as a fornicator and profane person. What a way to go. I don't want you to be known for all eternity or something like that. I want you to be known as the other good men that we read through, right? Now in Colossians chapter 4, I did say we're going to go back to Demas. So you're in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, and I'll we'll finish up on this. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. Because even though Demas is mentioned in a positive light in Colossians chapter 4, or well, later in the ministry of Paul, it says here, verse number 10, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, uh, Christians of Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. So what we learn here is that Demas was once serving God. Hey, he's a saved man. He's a believer, okay? And he's recognized for the work he's done in the Bible. But as he went on in life, he eventually gave up. Kind of like Mark. Remember how Mark got into the ministry and then he backed out? But then later in his life, he got right and he was profitable to the ministry? 
Well, Demas is kind of the opposite. Yeah, he starts well as well, but then he gets out of the ministry and never returns. Why does he get out of the ministry? Why did he forsake the ministry of the gospel with the Apostle Paul? It says because he loved this present world. Do you want to be known for all eternity? Again, the Bible's written for all eternity. We're going to see Demas in heaven. Oh, Demas, are you the one that loved this present world? Man, (laughs) what a record for eternity to have. I don't want that for you. I don't want that for me. Where we give up serving the Lord because we'd rather chase the pleasures of this world. And listen, the world, there is a lot of pleasures in this world. There's a lot of temptations. The devil will bring something into your life, guarantee, more than once, will bring something into your life to pull you out of church, to pull you out of serving God, and to get you stuck into some addiction of the world. And you need to be strong enough to say, no, I'm not going to love this world. I'm going to have the love of the Father. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to do the ministry that God has given me, the ministry of reconciliation. Hey, I might not be a perfect Christian all the time. I might have some bumps in my Christian life. But at the end of it all, I'm going to continue serving the Lord. I'm not going to give in to the pleasures of this world. Brethren, I'll wrap it up there. But how will you be remembered? That was the title. How will you be remembered? And, um, you know, we see many times great men being recognized. Again, just men and women like you and I, no difference. But I want you to be remembered for the good things. I want you to be remembered for the service you've done for the Lord. And so I hope this gives you some things to think about. You know, if there are areas of your life that you're lacking in and you can see these great qualities in these people, hey, you need to work toward those things. I don't know what they are. You probably know what they are. You know, most likely, I think you're like one of the greatest Christians on the earth. But you know who you are. (laughs) You know the weaknesses. You know the things that you struggle with. So, you know, make sure you challenge yourself. Make sure you ask the Lord God to help you in the weaknesses that you can be a great servant for Him. And I want you to be remembered for all eternity for being a great servant for the Lord. All right, God bless.